Well, I want to welcome everybody to the session. We're here to talk about uh, Brown and RISD's joint master's, uh, Master of Arts program in design engineering. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I just want to take a moment for the panelists to introduce themselves. I'll start. My name is Victoria Macritus, and I am the Assistant Director of Graduate Enrollment, and I will hand it off to Christopher Bull. I am Chris Bull. I'm a co-director of the program with Kiefer Nichols, and uh, I'm also the director of the Brown Design Workshop. So if it's noisy while I'm speaking, it's because my office is next to all this machinery. So <laughs> bear with us. And I'll pass it to Beth. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Altringer Eagle. Um, I recently joined the program as executive director after spending 10 years um, at Harvard and the engineering school. I was trained as a designer in architecture. I moved into um, the fashion world briefly and, uh, and then into product design. And these days I run my own small design firm. We do um, technical design consulting for a number of brands. Keeper. Thank you. Uh, my name is Keeper Nichols, and I am um, also co-director with Chris. And uh, my other, in my other role, I'm the uh, the head of the industrial design department at RISD. And uh, I've been, wow. I had a career in toy design, and I now I do consultant for different uh, companies, and um, I've been teaching for almost two decades. So happy to meet you guys today. Awesome. Thanks, folks. So I just want to talk about a few housekeeping items before we really get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. We'll be taking questions throughout the presentation. So if anything comes up, please feel free to use the Q&A box uh, on your Zoom sort of taskbar. We'll answer them as we go. If we feel like there are some questions that might be beneficial for the whole group, we'll wait until the end to answer those, or if they're sort of more qualitative and have a more long form answer. We'll be here for about 45 minutes. You know, it all depends on how many questions you all have. Hopefully you have a bunch of them, uh, but that's sort of how long you can expect to be here. We'll be talking about the program. We'll be talking about the application process. Um, and then, like I said, we'll be taking your questions. So just so we can all set expectations at the beginning. Um, but with that, I will hand it back over to you folks. Great, so our discussion topics for today, we're gonna to kick off with these and then open it up um, as quickly as we can to your questions. So we'll be talking about what is the MAID program? What makes it unique? Uh, who should be considering this program? What is our curriculum like? And what is the admissions process like? So the I can talk a little bit about the program highlights. One thing is it's one of the fir first joint master's degrees between RISD and Brown. Um, and the, the studio portion of the course of the program is the main portion, so a lot of studio uh, coursework and teaching. It's an 11 month program, so it's quite short, but it's very uh, dense and intense. Uh, and the resources of both institutions are at your disposal. So uh, that would include at RISD, the Nature Lab, the, and at Brown, the Brown Design Workshop that Chris was mentioning. And we'll go to the next slide. Great, so this is just a snapshot of the core course structure. So our students have, as you can see at the bottom there, electives throughout, those can be electives from uh, from Brown or from RISD, and uh, our students take a lot of different tracks through the program. It's very flexible for meeting their um, their individual career goals. And um, but this is the core course structure. So all of our students take the core courses. They start in the summer, so that's in August, um, and then uh, there's the summer courses on the Measure and Make Studio, the fall course is on uh, iterating with intention and the winter studio is on communication that's really design communication broadly speaking and the spring course is on the implementation studio so that's where our students are building and implementing their capstone project keeper will go into a little bit more detail for each of those core courses yes and so we'll talk a little bit about the summer course uh, 
it's about process, observing, understanding, changing, testing, and iterating, sort of the basic sort of the principles of, of design and engineering. And um, the fall studio, we get more into collaboration and the sort of the art of and, and science of collaboration, working on a sequence of three projects that engage partner organizations. So at this point, you're always in, uh, involved with outside uh, organizations that are collaborating with us. As we move through the projects, uh, the groups become increasingly independent in their problem setting and solution finding. And also, again, in the fall, you uh, unlike the summer, in the fall you have two elective courses, and as Beth was mentioning, they can be either at RISD or Brown, or one from each. In the winter, it's a shorter uh, winter session. It's four weeks long, and at this point we're going to be really looking at communication, visual communication, design communication, taking on the challenge of creating materials to communicate products and processes in ways that align with different audiences. So like how to get your message across and how to um, share your vision with others. The Spring Studio will be the sort of what was referred to as the capstone and we're in integrating and implementing uh, the semester long project with again with partner organizations that implement, test and refine ideas with the goals of creating value for the partner and compelling portfolio elements for each member of the cohort. And again, we have uh, uh, electives, again, from Brown or RISD, or both. Next slide. So one of the other very unique uh, aspects of the program is that the studios are co-taught by um, members of RISD and Brown. The external partners are from uh, both from private or and public sectors, nonprofit and profit. Uh, the elective courses are very broad and I think the students that are here now um, have the experience of having so much to choose from that it's that's a kind of a challenge I mean if you can imagine both RISD and Brown's uh, catalogs you know are available and the cohort itself is ca carefully chosen by that we we uh, mean that we really want collaboration to be a central focal point and so we're getting together people from various backgrounds so that you know and, and it's actually much more diverse than uh, we expected that you know the first cohort which is on campus right now and we are seeing how well they work together and how they share experiences and knowledge um, in a peer-to-peer -peer way next next slide So this slide gives a, a little bit of an overview of the, the current cohort. So remember, these are this is the first cohort. So it may change in the future, but on the left side, you can see some of the universities that they've come from. It's not a comprehensive list. And on in the right two columns, you can see some of the companies that they have already spent some time working on before joining our program. So you can see just a snapshot of the skill diversity and the location diversity of our current cohort. And on the next slide, um, this is um, on the next slide. Oh. Uh, oh. All right, I'll just talk through this part. Um, some of the career aspirations of our students um, include areas like product design, product management, UX, UI, experience design. Some of our students are interested in a hybrid digital physical design. Some of them are interested in social innovation, um, adaptive reuse buildings, building sciences, design consulting, emerging technologies, gamified design, and sustainable design. So you can see that there's almost as many different future career interests as there are students in the program, which leads to a really dynamic cohort, and we're excited about growing that in the future. So advice for applicants. So we're going to turn it over to Victoria, who will go over sort of the application requirements, and then we'll dig into those a little bit deeper after that. Awesome. Thank you so much for all that great program information. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the application process and what that looks like for folks. So 
First, let's go over the requirements. Of course, you can see the deadline right there. Um, we have our application linked on our website. We'd be more than happy to share that information with you if you're interested in applying. Uh, but you can see the list of requirements that we have specific to the MAID program. Um, we want your transcripts, of course, to get an idea of your academic history. So from any of the institutions that you've attended, um, MAID has a portfolio requirement, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, they have a really cool sort of structure for their portfolio. Your personal statement, letters of recommendation, and then and then some testing if English isn't your first language. Um, if you have any questions about fulfilling any of these requirements or sending any of this documentation, please don't hesitate to be in contact with the master's enrollment office. Um, I will be giving our email address at the end of the presentation, but we're here to help you with the application process. Your personal statement is a really wonderful way for the faculty committee to get to know you a little bit better and to get to know why exactly it is you want to study this particular discipline. Why are you interested in this academic area? What do you see yourself doing with it professionally down the line? What are your goals? Those are all really important things for the faculty to be able to know about you because it speaks to your fit for the program, right? It's also a piece of writing. It's a writing sample that we can assess from you to see what your level of writing ability is, what type of communicator are you, and all of those things are crucial parts of how you fit into any particular program. So spend time with it, make sure you edit it, and make sure it's an actual reflection of, of what you want to do with this major and where you see yourself going um, with this program. When you're choosing recommenders for your letter of recommendation, we really encourage you to choose folks who know you well within a classroom setting. And we want your recommenders to be able to speak to you as a member of the classroom community. Of course, folks who know you in other areas of life as well are welcome to submit letters of recommendation. Um, but just make sure that when you're asking for those letters of recommendation, you do it well in advance. You know the program deadline, application deadline. Uh, so work back from there and make sure that you're giving everybody ample time to get their recommendations in for you. Uh, but that's sort of how we feel about the letter of recommendation. Who you ask is really up to you, but we really want to hear from somebody who knows you and, and what your level of success will be in this program specifically. The TOEFL and IELTS, these are both English language proficiency exams. So what that means is if you don't speak English as your first language, or if you haven't attended an institution where English is the primary language of instruction, we want to make sure that your English is at a level where you'll be successful in a classroom setting. And that's why for those students, we require the TOEFL or the IELTS, either one will satisfy our English language proficiency requirement. Um, you can see all of the sort of details on the TOEFL and the IELTS on the screen now, the minimum score, our school code, but really that is the crux of why we want to see a TOEFL or an IELTS. If you're feeling like, hey, you know, I don't think I need to submit this for whatever reason, but it's still, you know, a requirement when I go to submit my application, you can also always be in contact with us about things like that. Now, if you're thinking, I, you know, because of COVID or other reasons, I don't feel safe taking an exam. There isn't an exam in my area. We now this year are, are allowing the at-home version of both the TOEFL and the IELTS, including the ITP Plus solution uh, for students in China who might not have access to that other exam. So uh, this is all important stuff to keep in mind for students who, for whom English is not their native language or first language and who did not attend an institution where the English is the medium of instruction. Now, the portfolio, uh, I want to hand it back over to the program so you folks can talk about the portfolio and how you look at it in the, in the application. The, the portfolio, in some ways, is a little bit like the personal statement, but with a different set of dimensions on it. So we see it as an opportunity for you to Tell us about yourself and what you're excited about doing, about the work that you've done, about the style that sort of says who you are. Um, and 
I think we take a little different perspective than a straight design program on this because it's it's not just are they a good designer in the graphic design sense, but how do you how do you go about finding solutions to issues that you face? How do you integrate other people into your process? What's your process look like? So uh, and and we feel like this gives uh, gives you another, as I said, another dimension that you can use to to tell us who you are. Because the better we know you, the easier it is to to figure out how you would fit in the program, what you would bring to it, and uh, and to for us to build a cohort that uh, that'll be exciting to be part of that will be successful in the kinds of things that they undertake and that will uh, get you launched in the direction that you'd like to go. Great. Yeah, I, I can't even add much to that. Chris, you did a good job. I, I think that part of the um, a thing about portfolios not everyone who applies has a, maybe ever done a portfolio before so um, don't feel like uh, that it has to be a certain way and I think I would follow Chris's uh, idea of just tell us who you are and do it uh, with images and visually so it's not like you have to have a, a big uh, archive of work that's already visual but you can put together a portfolio with things you've already done and things you'd like to do Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. So I, I think that, you know, the crux of a lot of the application pieces are really, you know, we want to get to know you as a student, what your potential is as a part of the program. And for that reason, one last thing I'll talk about is we have a holistic review process. So I use the Royal We, the faculty review committee has a holistic review process. So folks are looking at all of these different pieces of your application to suss out what type of academic fit you'll be for the program, but also sort of generally, what are you going to do with this master's degree? What are your goals and how are you going to contribute, right? So I think the portfolio is a really good example of just another avenue of, of getting to know you as a person as we navigate the holistic review process. So I promised that I would be giving out email addresses. You can see on the screen now, we have the, the MADE program email address. So if you have any program questions, that's a really great place to start. If you have questions about the application or the requirements, you can of course email the master's admission uh, email address at Brown. So we'll get your questions answered regardless of which email address you email, I promise. Uh, we're happy to take questions now. So if folks want to start uh, typing their questions in the Q&A box, I will open it and we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Great. So one of the questions on here that I would love for you folks to talk about is about how how far out do you need to be? How, how much career experience should you have to be successful in this program if, if there is any sort of barometer for that? Hmm. Um, I can take a crack at that. So our current students, um, their average age is 25, but there's actually quite a lot of range. So some of them are straight out of undergrad and some of them have several years of work experience. Um, so it's all sort of possible <laughs> in that sense. We're not looking for a specific level of experience, but we will, like like we said before, look holistically at your application. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that one of the diverse, one of the issues of diversity that I think were, uh, resonates is experience, diversity of experience. And so if a person who's been out, I see some say 10 plus years out with product design or other experience, bring that, that that's what you would be bringing to the cohort. And er everyone in the cohort is bringing kind of their own unique experiences, their own unique perspectives. And because we're focused on collaboration, it's what uh, uh, peers can do together that generates you know the 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 out the outcomes the output 
the deliverables for for what what ends up happening in the studio. So we I don't we don't have anyone right now that has that much uh, experience after graduation, but that's not to an indication of um, that we wouldn't accept someone like that. Of course, we would consider everyone that has um, just, you know something to offer, and I, I think all of you would have something to offer. And on the flip side, what do you feel like the program, what would be the value add of the program for somebody who has that much experience? I can give one answer and then I'm sure there will be more, but um, one of the things, so one, of, one area of my research is creative collaboration. And the fact that you worked in teams in the past doesn't necessarily mean that you've been trained to work really effectively in teams. And because, the, because we have a focus on collaboration pedagogically in this program, um, I think anyone can learn from, from that in terms of working more effectively, even if you have experience within your domain, learning to work more effectively with others and especially a really diverse set of others like we have in this program, which you wouldn't likely find in a, in a normal work environment. Hmm. Yeah, I'm saying yet because we see the work environment changing too, and and the need to have uh, diverse teams of people working on problems because things are so complex that for an individual to to be effective is really challenging these days. And so one of the things the program does is give you opportunities to to work in diverse teams and and uh, work on problems that have uh, facets that typically go beyond what you might see in a, in a standard design office. Um, and I think there was an add on about um, letters of recommendation if you're that far out. And I think it's, it's we're saying that Again, this what we're looking for is ways to know you, right? And I think choose your recommenders from people that know you. And uh, I, I think we're not concerned about how many are from academic background and how many are from professional background. You, it should make sense to you. If it makes sense to you, I think it'll make sense to us also. I would add one, um, I think so it might be useful to give an example. So we had Tesla come visit our program a few weeks ago. And one of the things so the, the, the team from Tesla that came recruits for basically all of uh, all of the teams within Tesla. And they were really struck by the collaboration emphasis on, in our program. And they have units within their company that are just focused on um, people who can integrate the components from all of the other teams um, together. And so I just want to give a clear example for how the work environment is changing and how these skills in terms of being able to integrate well with others and, and also create integrated design and technology products are really important. Awesome, that was, uh, that was great. So there's a bunch of questions in here from folks about sort of more nitty gritty aspects of the program. So, you know, is this the type of program that somebody who's interested in other types of design other than than product design? Is this a program where students will find success? Uh, will students be uh, making like physical items. There's a question about, you know, the workshop skills course and that sort of a thing. So I'm curious to hear what you all have to say about those two aspects. You know, what can, what can students expect to produce? And then what also, what types of design might be interesting for students in this program? Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. I'll give a, I'll start a little bit. Uh, in terms of different types of design the answer is yes we have people who are interested in uh, graphic design product design we have people interested in different types of engineering from uh, computer science to mechanical engineering electrical so i think that that's part one part of the answer the the brown design workshop which chris can talk a lot about is a is a make a 
state-of-the-art maker space which is right down the hall from the um, made studio so students are there a lot working on prototypes that they're going to be testing so physical making is a part of it and it's uh, uh, but it's not the only part of it but, but did we have a lot of facilities that can support it and that do su support it so um, yeah I think that that's that'll be my contribution to the answer I'm gonna let uh, Chris weigh in on that as well and well it, it seemed like part of the question is about do I need a technical background and I think that's sort of you know said is this program skewed towards engineers and the answer to that is no and and maybe it's it's helpful to talk a little bit about um the current cohort uh there are 19 students in it seven of them come from technical backgrounds six from design backgrounds and six from others where they're applications were so strong we couldn't say no so that, so that um what what we're trying to do is build a cohort that we think will will thrive together and and so i think one of the things to think about maybe is what what are you going to bring to the program because it, it is about what not just what you're going to take from it, but what you're going to share with the others in, in the program and with us as well. And so I think approaching it from that way rather than, uh, you know, do I need technical skills or design skills? Um, don't worry. Yeah. And one thing I'd pick up on that is we, in the in the starting core studio in the summer studio we tend to begin with a participatory participatory design or community design uh, methodology and so the students are embedded in a community organization and solving a real problem for them and so that's a that's an example of a type of design that's built into the program that is not particularly technical in the normal sense of the word, but is more about strategy and policy and being very user centered in your thinking about a design solution. And so, you know, not only are we open to that, it's already built into the program. So there's another question. Uh, there's a bunch of questions. You guys did such a great job. Everybody's very excited. So uh, there's another question about the project piece and the, the maker piece of the program and whether or not students have autonomy in what they're working on or if there's restrictions based off of corporate partners um, and things like that. I'm, I'm going to say, first of all, that Corporate partners sounds a little narrow. And we do have external partners, but they come from all sectors and have interests that are very broad. The, we engage in external partners because we feel that it's important that you're designing for someone else. You're not designing for yourself. I'm sorry, I'll take that back because what we want you to, to design is your trajectory through the program. That's yours. We want the work that you do to be engaged with others because we feel like that's a really important piece of doing this work well. So, so uh, you have some agency, uh, I'm not going to claim that you have full autonomy. So, but it's it's it it it's one of these things where there isn't an answer. Uh, it's going to depend on who the partners are, what your interests are, because you can certainly skew projects in ways that that meet your needs as well as the needs of let's call them the clients. I. I see a question about 
the mixing of digital and physical uh, product design and and changing design thinking. And I, I will say that last uh, on Friday, I visited a class which was an elective course at RISD. Uh, two of our current MADE students were was taking the class. It was It's a class on design for impact taught by Charlie Cannon. And this particular class is so innovative. I mean, it was, it was a really, I was there for, you know, three hours. I, and um, in terms of design thinking, they go really deep in this class into what is design thinking and how, how does different type of thinking skills apply to the design process. And uh, so what I, I'm saying that that's really a snapshot of something happening last week, but it says that what I um, want to refer to is the fact that you, because you have uh, two electives per student, per semester, you have the opportunity to take courses like that and other courses that are very innovative in terms of what the future of design looks like and you know that kind of thing is happening on both campuses here. So yes, the answer is yes, you can um, get exposed to that and participate in that kind of uh, process as well. That may not answer the question <laughs> that you were asking, Victoria, but uh, mm -hmm. that was a little bit of a side answer, but I'll, I'll stop talking now. As a small logistical point, if you haven't been to Brown and Rusty, we say both campuses, but they really are essentially physically co-located as you walk um, from one to the other. You don't even notice that you changed campuses. It's a really small and uh, and um, and I don't know quaint <laughs> little cool. dual campus. And I think it's really cool as, as somebody who just joined. These universities are right next to each other. It feels like one space. It's very cool. I actually so I work at Brown. But I have to walk through RISD to get to the rest of Brown, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. So, yeah. it's, it's really easy to cross basically both. And uh, it's, you know, maybe 15 minutes walking. Absolutely. So I, I think the last question we'll take, uh, there's sort of two questions that are in the same realm for stu prospective students. What type of academic background are students? students coming from for this program what what are you what types of academic backgrounds i know we've talked a lot about sort of your interests driving things and, and what you want to do but but what, what types of academic backgrounds do you think would find success in this program and then also how can students on the flip side shadow students attend classes in order to be able to understand whether or not the program is a good fit for them and those are sort of two different things how am i a fit for the program and how is the program a fit for me hmm. well i'll take a little start yeah i think if you are local um uh to, to providence i could imagine you coming to a, a critique like at the end of a semester or in the middle of a semester when students are showing their work uh, and having like a status update, there's an opportunity to be invited to something like that. And you can see how, you know, how the, what you can see what the students are doing and, and how they are uh, being evaluated. And um, was the other, the other part of the question, um, what academic backgrounds? Uh, again, we're very open-minded. We, we thought at the very beginning that half of the cohort would be from a design background and half of the cohort would be from an engineering background. But once we started putting the first cohort together, we realized that it was actually three groups. It was people with a design background, people with an engineering background, and other. And all three of these groups are the same size, basically. So the other is made up of a variety of, uh, of um, experiences that we when we like we said when we looked at the applications we couldn't say no and i think that that's the important piece of all this that we are actually learning about this as we do it it's a very new program as you know and so you're in a position to help answer these questions yourselves with what you send us as application what you send us as portfolio and your personal statement i'm sure that this cohort coming in will be different than the one here now, and it'll be full of maybe surprises for all of us, to be honest. So, yeah. Good surprises, I'm sure. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> That's I think I mean. enjoying making things is probably an important prerequisite for the program because that is what, what you'll do here. But how you get to the point of being a person who really enjoys making things and making things with other people, uh, we're pretty open to what that backstory looks like. There's a question in the chat I wanted to just quickly answer if we have time for it. Um, it was about, uh, can students reach out to, to external partners or suggest external partners? And uh, if, we, if we haven't emphasized this already, we're a very collaboratively minded uh, group of people running the program and those, you know, the students who come to the program are as well. So we're absolutely open to that and interested in that conversation. Definitely, I think, you know, one of the coolest things about the program is is how collaborative and open minded everybody is to get to that end point of like design right so I think that that's sort of been the theme of the presentation today. Um, that's it for the questions we have in the Q&A, but you all have our email addresses. They're readily available on the website. You're more than welcome to email us to ask any questions about the application process, email the program to ask questions about maybe coming to a critique, asking questions about, you know, what are current students doing and that sort of a thing. But I just want to take a moment to thank our panelists from the program. We really appreciate you all coming and sharing your expertise with the prospective students. I'm sure they really appreciate it as the application sort of comes up. <laughs> well, yes, thank, thank you. you. For, yeah. Thanks for, for sharing. <laughs> All right, everybody. So I'll end it there. Have a great rest of your day and uh, we'll see you soon. Great. Bye. We hope to see Bye. you in our application pool. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.